Hi everybody, and welcome to this Korchik's class video on liberal democracy in Canada and the separation of powers. Now, when we talk about a liberal democracy, basically what that means is that, well, it's a democracy that's based on the principles of liberalism. And we trace this back to John Locke's belief that a government's role is to protect people's life, liberty, and property. The most important principle of a liberal democracy is that the government is going to be responsible to the will of the people. So that the government is going to do what the people want. And therefore, some of the most important elements of a liberal democracy are, for example, free regular elections, where if people feel that the government is no longer representing the will of the people, the people can vote to select a new government. We also need to have multiple political parties, so different choices with different ideas that are going to be representative of the will of the people. We need rule of law, so this idea that everybody is going to be equal under the law and that our leaders and those in government aren't going to be abusing the law and that the law applies to them the same way that it applies to any of us. And finally, we need what's called the separation of powers so that the government is broken up into different things that have an equal power and will balance each other so that no one branch of government can become more powerful or corrupt than the others and that these different parts of government are going to act as a check on each other to make sure that doesn't happen. In Canada, the three branches of government are the legislative, the judicial, and the executive. So the legislative branch is our parliament, federally and the different legislative assemblies provincially. This is made up of the MPs we elect because we have a what's called a representative democracy and we elect people to make decisions on our behalf so that we don't have to make decisions on every single new law or new idea that needs to pass. We elect people on our behalf to do that for us. And in parliament, they debate they vote and pass new laws that become part of our laws in Canada. The second branch of government is the executive branch, where it's made up of the prime minister and cabinet federally. So the prime minister and the minister, minister of defense, um, minister of justice, minister of finance, minister of health, and so on. And they take those laws that have been made and passed by parliament and they enact them based on um, when and where necessary. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Finally, there's the judicial branch. And the judicial branch's responsibility is to make sure that the laws that are passed in Canada are reflective of our sort of grounding legal document, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So if government tries to pass a law that it might in some way violate a section of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, a challenge can be made to the courts and the Supreme Court can decide whether that law is constitutional or not or in line with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms or not. As an example of the executive branch's role in governing Canada, uh, we saw that during the COVID-19 crisis in Canada when on March 25th, 2020, the Minister of Health, Patty Haidu, made a statement about the use of the Quarantine Act, which was a law that Parliament passed many years ago, and it's meant to give the government power during a crisis such as this. And around the use of the Quarantine Act, the Minister said that the number of cases of COVID-19 is increasing daily, both at home and globally. Earlier this month, we asked travelers entering Canada to self-isolate for 14 days to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in Canada. To protect the health and safety of returning Canadians and those who are around them, we are strengthening our measures at the border. Travelers returning to Canada will be subject to a mandatory 14-day self-isolation under the Quarantine Act. Right, so the executive branch in this case is using a law passed by the legislative branch um, in order to protect people in Canada. An example of the role of the judicial branch as being part of this Canadian separation of powers 
we see when the Supreme Court makes a decision about an existing law that in some way violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter is what we call a living document, where sometimes the text doesn't have to change, but the interpretation of what's in the text changes. And in 2015, there was a major Supreme Court case related to physician-assisted suicide, which basically means that when patients are living with terminally ill diseases that can cause excruciating pain or make it really difficult uh, for that person to live, basically just waiting for the disease to take their life, they can have the doctor put an end to their life instead of them having to live in that pain. And up until 2015, that was illegal in Canada, but the Supreme Court used a justification under the charter to make it legal. So in the case Carter v. Canada, uh, which was decided on February 6, 2015, uh, the Supreme Court said this about it. It is a crime in Canada to assist another person in ending her own life. As a result, people who are grievously and irredeemably ill cannot seek a physician's assistance in dying and may be condemned to a life of severe and intolerable suffering. A person facing this prospect has two options. She can take her own life prematurely, often by violent or dangerous means, or she can suffer until she dies from natural causes. The choice is cruel. So the Supreme Court decided that people shouldn't have to live with these awful choices and that this physician assisted suicide should be an option to them despite having been illegal in Canada up until that point. And that shows how the Supreme Court, the executive branch of government and the legislative branch of government are in this balance where they each have a check on each other to make sure that overall the government is respecting the will of the people and that one branch of government can't have undue power because these other branches of government are going to have a check on their power. And this is a tricky balance in liberal democracies. And sometimes maybe it's necessary for a government to act against the will of the people in order to protect security or for other reasons. And again, those are really tricky, challenging things that are sometimes difficult in a democracy. And democracy in general can be pretty difficult. And we'll finish with a quote by Winston Churchill around that. In a speech to Parliament on the 11th of November, 1947, Churchill said that many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all of those other forms that have been tried from time to time. So democracy is a challenge. We keep working on trying to make it better. And to this day, we haven't really found anything else that uh, works a little bit better to both protect our freedom and security at the same time. But as we continue on, maybe we'll see our liberal democratic systems continue to evolve and continue to change. With that, thanks for watching and see you again next time.